thank you so much for for being patient whilst we got sorted right so we'll just wait a moment for everybody to join um but I am Karis and I've worked with EdShed for about two and a half years. And we've got Amelia, who's our EdShed trainer here, who will be doing the webinar with me today. Now, as we go through the webinar, if you've got any questions as we go through, the webinar should only last about 15 to 20 minutes. Um, I will answer some questions as Amelia is speaking in the first half. At the bottom, if you can see the Q&A button, if you just click in there and type any questions that you've got, and I'll try and do my best to answer them whilst Amelia is talking. Any that I can't answer for any reason, um, I can get to your email from the Q&A and email you afterwards with an answer if needed. We're not going to use the raise hand or any of the other um, icons tool today, just the um, Q&A tool, which I'll answer as we go. Um, also throughout, I think Amelia's got a couple of activities that you can participate in, um, but it's completely up to you. And we will record this and put it on our YouTube channel should you wish to forward it to any other colleagues tomorrow. So whenever you're ready, Amelia. OK, so we'll go through what makes an effective speller. And really, there are five main strands to being an effective speller. Um, there are there is your phonological knowledge, orthographic knowledge morphological knowledge, etymological knowledge, and your visual knowledge as well. So this looks a little bit like this. We've got the dark blue showing our linguistic knowledge here. We've got the phonological, orthographic, morphological, and etymological knowledge. Now we do actually need to process this and apply it to spelling our words. For example, if I was spelling a word using my phonological knowledge like cat, I'd have to think what sounds are in the word cat, what letters can I use to represent those sounds? And then what do they look like and actually put them down on the paper? So that does take a little bit of strategic knowledge and application, a little bit of processing time. It is much quicker to go from your visual memory or your memorized words, the ones that are in your lexical store. However, they go straight into spelling really quickly, but your linguistic knowledge is what's built up this memorized words and the lexical store there. So I'll talk through each of these strands and how important they are. And then Karis will give some examples of where we've done that in Spelling Shed as well. So to start with, the phonological knowledge is about knowing your phonemes or your sounds in English and the graphemes or letters to represent those sounds. So just to start off with, how many ways can you think of writing the or sound? So for or, I'll give you a couple of minutes just to jot any down that you can think of. It's usually easier to try and think of a word with it in and then how it's spelt in that word. Okay, so I'll pop some answers up. There are actually quite a lot. Um, so here, this is a bit out of our alphabetic code. This is actually from Phonics Shed, um, but it is a free resource. So you can go onto Phonics Shed and download it from there. And it is an adult resource as well. So even if you don't use Phonics Shed as your phonics scheme, you can still use this to help you. Uh, so the second one down on here is OR. Um, and we can see we've got OR like in horse, AW like in fawn, AU like in astronaut. And they're the most common ones that we usually cover in phonics. But we have got all these other options. I would be very surprised if anybody did all of those by memory. I think I'd struggle myself as well with some of those. Um, so moving on from that phonics, we also need orthographic knowledge. So we know there's maybe 15 ways of doing the or sound. We need to know when to use them as well. So orthographic knowledge is about knowing which letter sequences are possible and plausible in English. So ortho is a Greek root and it's got lots of meanings, but one of them is correct. And graph is the same root as in the word grapheme. It's talking about writing um, or putting things down as well. So if we look at these words here at the bottom, idea, pan and pony, how can we immediately tell that they aren't correct? Well, if I look at idea, I know that I don't use the I, G, H 
spelling of I at the beginning of words. I never, ever do that. So, or I can't think of any at the moment. So that's probably the least likely spelling for that. And the PN and the KN making the N sound, we'd only use that at the beginning of words. So it's really unlikely that they would be in that position in the word. So that can all help um, our orthographic knowledge as well. Unscrambles are actually really helpful um, for building orthography and orthographic skills. So if I look at this one here, I've got the SCI making the SH sound here. And that only ever happens in English when it's part of a suffix. Um, so if I find the rest of the suffix there, then I've actually not got very many letters left to deal with. So if I finish it off, I've got the word luscious. So that's how using your orthography can help you with these unscramble activities. And then we've got the morphological and etymological knowledge. So morphology is about the study of the form of words and the parts that make them up. And etymology is about the origin of words instead. So here I've got the morphemes in the word triceratops. So a morpheme um, is like a grapheme and a phoneme. Morpheme is the smallest chunk of meaning in a word. Phoneme is the smallest unit of sound. Grapheme is the smallest unit of writing to represent those sounds. Morpheme is the smallest unit of meaning. So here I've got those three morphemes, tri, Sarah, and tops, each of their meanings, and then the roots that they have come from as well. So it's mainly Greek origin for these roots, although um, sometimes you get Latin and Greek influences at the same time. So now if I take that forward, knowing that tri means three, I can apply that to trident, tricycle, triangle, or any of these other words at the bottom as well. I quite liked trilemma. I'd never heard of that, but it's like a dilemma where you've got three problems to choose from instead of just two. And the etymology is really helpful for explaining why things are the way they are. So, for example, photograph has the phonemes o, t, o, g, r, a. And in this word, the phoneme is spelt with a ph each time. That's because it's Greek origins. Photo is a Greek root, meaning light, and graph is a Greek root, meaning writing. And PH is the Greek spelling of the phoneme. So a photograph is an image written with light onto the paper or drawn onto the paper with light as well. Apparently, they originally tried to call it a photogram, but that didn't really catch on. So they changed it to photograph. And then finally, we've got your visual memory, that last strand. And at the end of the day, even with all that phonics, orthography, morphology and etymological knowledge, um, it is still a visual activity. We are still doing a visual representation of a word. Um, but we need to build up this mental lexicon and store of the words to commit it to our visual memory. And the phonology, morphology, etymology and orthography of the words helps us to build that up. So your visual memory is much better when you can attach the meaning to it. So if we think about morphology, the chunks of meaning, the morphemes within the word, it, if we understand what they are, it's much easier to remember a pattern. So we're going to prove that now. Um, I'm going to show you a word on the screen and then I'll take it away. I want you to have a go at writing it down and see how, how easy you find it. And then we'll try it again with the second one. So here's the word. I'll just give you a couple of seconds. Have a go at writing it down. It is actually um, from a Roald Dahl story, that one. It is a made up word still, but it's easier to understand because we've got the two chunks of meaning in there. And then let's try it again with a different one. Okay. Have a go at writing that one down. I can imagine you're finding that one much trickier than the first one because we can't just separate it into those two chunks of meaning. It makes it quite complicated. So even though we're working on building up these memorized words and that visual memory, we are building it from all this linguistic knowledge as we're going. So it's really important not to forget those bits. 
And another important point to remember is we're meant to be teaching patterns rather than lists of words. So, for example, we've got the statutory requirements from the national curriculum here are the patterns of the spelling. The example words that they give, it does say are non-statutory. So we don't actually have to worry too much about what the words are. We're not trying to learn the list of words. We're trying to learn the pattern. And then we can use this to think about spelling really effectively. So if I get this sentence from a child, I have a pet rabbit called monkey. I can think about the different responses for it. If I go with response one, that might encourage the child to be able to spell the word have in the future. However, if I say, can we remember what we learned about the words that end with the v sound? They usually end V-E, not just a V then all of a sudden I've got access to all of these other words that have the same pattern there as well. Sorry. So um, how Spelling Shed develops this linguistic knowledge through the scheme, I'm going to hand over to Karis so that she can show you some of our things within it. Great, thank you. So we've got all of the different strands that Amelia has been talking about going through all of our spelling shed materials. So for each year, going from year one to year six, we have lesson plans, a PowerPoint and printable worksheets for every single lesson for all of those year groups. And as Amelia said, we really want to be getting away from just learning the word lists and equipping pupils with all of these different methods to help them learn more complex spellings. So we've just included a few different examples so you can just get a bit of an insight into what Spelling Shed offers, but for both the teacher and pupil. So here, for example, we've got something from stage five. Now stage is the same as year, so this is for year five. So here you can see that we're still using phonemes. A lot of time we forget about these as children go up in the school after sort of key stage one is over, but we really use these to build on learning more complex words. So here you can see just in year five, we've got um, phoneme frames, and you can see this is from an independent activity. So a worksheet that a child might use and just a little clip from a lesson plan as well to show you how you might explain and use those within the same lesson. And here we've got a year two and year six lesson. So very, very different age groups. But you can see here the consistency of using phonemes throughout the school as children go up the school. So here we've also uh, got syllables using those to map on also sound buttons and again, phoneme frames. Then with orthographic knowledge. Here you can see a few different activities uh, from year three and year one to help children understand and know that different letters make up different sounds. So here we have got identifying the I sound, which as Amelia earlier mentioned, IGH wouldn't be found at the beginning of a word. So it's just equipping children with that knowledge. And we've also got OU here making the OW in hound and the A uh is in touch. And then again, just using different methods to use um, orthographic mapping to map these words and use that as another method to help children uh, learn more complex words. So that might be within whether it's phonemes, as I mentioned before, so using sound buttons or phoneme frames or also syllables as well. Now with um, morphology, this, as Amelia has also just mentioned, is the smallest meaning of a word. And we can change the meaning of the word by adding a prefix or suffix to a base word or root word. So you can see some activities that are within a year six lesson here. So here's the corresponding plan and one of the activities from the PowerPoints for children to add prefixes and suffixes or both to change the meaning of a word. And then here we've got a compound words activity where you've got words with a certain meaning and we're combining them here to make a new word and a new meaning. And here we've got one of our lovely word sheds, which we use throughout um, and have different labels depending on what activity it is. And this is a really nice one where you add a prefix and a suffix. So you're changing the meaning of a word by adding um, 
those few letters that might change the entire meaning and we've also got it in a sentence. Then with etymology, which is the origin of words, also using this as a method to understand and become an effective speller. So here's one from a year three lesson and looking at the word sound and where the word sound has come from. So sonus, which is from a, a Roman word. And then knowing the meaning and the origin of these different parts of words. So for example, if we look here for our year four with in, which means not, and knowing that in means not and having it in front of these other words and having those combined to make a new word, we can then get the children to match the word to the definition and using all of that knowledge that will then equip them to be a more effective speller. So we're coming towards the end of our webinar now. It's nice and short and sweet, but um, here's some of the pricing if you are interested in potentially getting Spelling Shed. You can sign up for a free 30 day trial for, you can do it for a whole school. You can get the children to even log in with a free trial and that will completely end after the 30 days. So you don't need to worry about canceling it. Here are some of the prices uh, for the different types of accounts you get all of the same uh, content, the price difference between sort of parents and schools and teachers is just the amount of pupils you can put on there. So for a parent account, that's up to five children. So maybe if you're a tutor and you have a small amount of children, that would be the best option for you. Um, you can also do a school account. And as you can see, the price depends per pupil on how many pupils you want to buy that for. And for a teacher, it's just for up to 36 licenses. Now, at the moment, we have our whole SPAG scheme included, and that's all the teaching PowerPoints from year one to year six and corresponding quizzes, which you can assign pupils on their online login. Um, or also you can uh, convert those quizzes into worksheets, but soon that won't be included in Spelling Shed. So I'd encourage you to sign up um, in the next month or so if you would like access to our SPAG scheme as well. Now, Spelling Shed, all the pupils have logins and you are able to allocate spellings with a particular rule that you are learning that week. And you can allocate that rule to the children and then they can play the games with just the rule or the list that you are learning in that week. And just last thing from me, if you have enjoyed the webinar, I do actually deliver training packages um, with EdShed as well. So we've got teaching spelling effectively using Spelling Shed is one of those. It is a really popular package at the minute. So details of this are all on our website. If you just click that training tab at the top, it will give you all the information and hopefully we'll keep adding new ones in there as well. Brilliant. And if you've got um, any other questions regarding trials or training, if you just email our support team, which is support at edshed.com, we've um, got lots of really helpful staff there that will email you back within 24 or 48 hours. All right, so this will now be on our upload our YouTube. I'm just going to quickly check if there are any extra questions um, before we go. So we've got different questions about being um, children being able to play this on laptops or iPads. You can do it on both. There is an app for Spelling Shed that you can purchase separately from the App Store if you want. But most of our schools um, just use it for free on the web browser. So you can do that on any device. Um, if you'd like to sign up, whether it's for a parent account um, or teacher account, anything, if you go to edshed.com, you'll need to create a login there. And then once you've logged in and verified your account, there'll be the option there to either start a free trial or take out a paid subscription. And then we've also got some other questions. Let's have a quick look. And um, so um, I answered the one about the time um, for the brilliant. lessons. So we recommend half an hour for year one, uh, 45 minutes for year two for the first three half terms. And then for the last three half terms, upping that to an hour to get that bit of progression in there. And then for stage three to six or year three to six, we recommend an hour as well. Yeah. And then you can use, if you have Phonic Shed, Phonic Shed and Spelling Shed are designed to be taught side by side from year one uh, in year one in year two. 
someone here is asking about whether it worked the different phonics scheme you can use it alongside another phonics scheme that's absolutely fine it's just if you were using phonic shed they'd sort of align up and match but you can teach it separately as a separate lesson that's absolutely fine i think yeah, it is one hour per week for that session sorry just to clarify and then there are a few um different things there as well i've just seen one about pupils working below age related expectation now i think it completely depends it's really hard for us to say um where to sort of start you get access to all of the different the whole scheme from year one to year six and one of the reasons that we call them stages and not year groups is that the child is then unaware of you setting spelling say for a young year group but it completely depends on where sort of the gap in that children's knowledge is. Would you agree, Amelia? Yes, absolutely. Um, We've got the diagnostic quizzes that can help with that as well um, on the scheme page on the website. Yeah, we do. I think that is everything. We don't have any SAT style spelling sheets, um, but I think we have some practice sats spag quizzes um which you could use um if you're practicing for those i think that's everything if you think of anything else or talk to um any other colleagues or members of staff um just email support to edshed.com if you think about it afterwards and we'll get back to you but i'm going to end this now so thanks so much everyone for listening cheers bye <laughs>